welcome to Israel. It's midnight from Jerusalem, our weekly virtual worship service, and as always, a collaboration between loveisrael.org and the Congregation of the Word. We're going to begin tonight from the book of Psalms and Psalm 9. So if you'd like, follow along with me, the book of Psalms and Psalm 9. Now, frequently, Psalms have what's known as inscriptions. In English Bibles and other languages, they set them apart from the text, which one ought not do. It's part of God's word. It's an instruction. Sometimes it gives us an event. Sometimes it tells us about how to chant this, what instruments are most fitting for this psalm, which would have been said, and as I mentioned, chanted with a group or a leader. But we're going to begin just reading two verses, verses 2 and 3 in the Hebrew text, the second part of verse 1 and verse, verse 2 in the English text. So let's begin. O de Hashem beko libi asapra ko nifloatecha es mecha ve e elza vach a zamra shemcha oyon. And what does that mean? O de Hashem, I will give thanks, O Lord, beko libi with all my heart. A sapra ko niflotecha. I will speak or tell or relate all of your wondrous deeds. Es mecha ve elza vach. I will be glad and I will rejoice in you. A zamra shimcha elyon. And I will sing of your most high name. Shimcha elyon. Your most high name. Now let's turn to the book of Deuteronomy in chapter 6. As I said, many have the tradition to stand. Others have the tradition to sit and cover their eyes when they speak this verse of Scripture. From Deuteronomy chapter 6, and we'll read verses 4 through 9. Again, first in Hebrew. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Hafta et Adonai Elohecha, Beko Levavcha, Uvako Nafshecha, Uvako Meodecha. Vehayu Hadvarim Ha Ele, Asher Anoki Mitzvacha, Hayom Al Levavecha. Veshina Netan Levanecha, Ve de Bartambam, Ve Shiftecha, Ve Vetacha, Uvletacha, Vader Ushapecha, Ukomecha. Uchartam Le Ot Al Yedecha. Vehayu le totafot ben anecha, uchtaftam au mezuzot betecha, uvesherecha. We'll translate that into English. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your, your essence, the very being of yourself. And these things which I command you shall be upon your heart, and you shall teach them diligently to your sons, and that would imply daughters as well, and speak of them when you sit in your house and when you walk on the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. And you shall, shall bind them for a sign upon your hand, and they shall be totafot, frontlets or phylacteries between your eyes and you shall write them upon the doorposts of your house and upon your gates now let us take a moment to pray to our lord O lord our god we exalt your name for you and you alone are god we praise you for your loving kindness your steadfast love your mercy and your forgiveness and Lord, we bow before you in wonder that you, being this perfect God Almighty, that you would desire to have a covenantal relationship with us. So Lord, we come before you this day with thanksgiving. We praise your name, and we turn now our attention to those 
who are sick, who have been injured, who are suffering physically, Lord, we pray for healing. We pray for those who are discouraged and, and inwardly feeling pain and sorrow for whatever reason. Lord, we pray for not only of a healing of the body, but also of that inner person, the soul of the individual. And Lord, we know that your word states that you want us to prosper both, both physically and emotionally and, of course, spiritually that we walk in your pathways, that we do your will, that we manifest your glory, and that we become a blessing to others. Lord, we want to be those that, that speak and manifest the truth of your word, that reveal that there is a God who is loving, but also a God that one day will bring his judgment, his judgment of wrath into this world. And we pray for, for people to be aware of that, and prepared for that. Lord, we, we also come before you praying for the nation of Israel first and foremost and your covenant people that do not know you yet. We pray that they might embrace this new covenant, a covenant that was ratified by the blood of Messiah. And not only do we pray for Israel, but we pray for all nations. For we know that ultimately your kingdom people are from a variety of tongues and languages and nations and peoples. And we thank you, God, that you are a God of pure love, a love that is extended to us by means of that gospel message. So, Lord, we pray for those who are in darkness, who do not know the truth. We pray that the light of your word would be, would be manifested to them. And, Father, we pray for those who are also in locations being persecuted because of their faith. Lord, we ask that there might be a change, a change in their situation. We also pray for, for power and strength and sustenance to overcome the attacks of, of others. Lord, we know that there are people today at this very moment who are being tortured because of faith in, in your son, Messiah Jesus. And we pray for them. And we pray that there might be a transformation of thought in these places that you would bring, bring to faith those who are administering this, this pain and these cruel acts, that they might be changed and embrace the truth of your word. Lord God, we know that we are living in a critical time, a transitional time, a time where more and more that which is good is seen as evil, and that which is evil is being braced and, and applauded. So, Lord, we ask that we might be sensitive to the times and the seasons, that we might be spiritually prepared, that we might make our prayer life that which is a priority to us, because we know it's only through prayer that truly your spirit and your power and your truth and your word and your, your illumination is provided to us. So Lord, teach us how you, your son, prayed often throughout the night that we might be willing to make that same type of, of commitment to prayer. Lord God, bless us now as we turn our thoughts to your word. In the blessed name of Messiah Yeshua, we up, offer up these things. Amen. God is indeed a delivering God who brings us through obstacles, hardships, attacks, persecutions, the faithlessness of others, the wickedness of others, in order that we might be found where God wants us to be. So before we go anywhere else in this message, looking at the text that, that has been prepared for us, I want to ask you a question. And that is, do you have confidence that you are where God wants you to be and in the midst of that location, are you doing what he would have you to do? See, most people are in the wrong location, and most people are doing the wrong thing. It's only when we truly turn to God with a repentant heart, wanting to submit to him, seeking revelation, then and only then, will God begin to move in that mighty way, placing his hand upon us because we have received 
that covenantal relationship through the gospel. That his hand might be upon us and guiding us, directing us where he would have us to be. And as I said last week, and I'll repeat myself this week, the Apostle Paul was that type of individual. One who indeed submitted to the moving, the direction, the leadership of the Holy Spirit in his life. He trusted, he did not doubt, and he knew that just because things were, were going difficultly for him didn't mean that God had departed from him and that this wasn't part of God's purpose. No, Paul knew to serve God means to suffer and it means that obstacles and, and difficult things were going to be placed upon him. So with that said, take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Acts chapter 28, the last chapter of the book of Acts, chapter 28. And what we see here is that Paul, last week we saw that he was in that, that terrible storm for, for 14 nights, 14 days, that they were all fasting, but in the end, God faithfully brought them to shore, all 276 individuals. And we're going to see that this chapter opens up with reminding that and then carrying on the, the account. So Acts chapter 28 and verse 1. The first thing that's mentioned here, it says, and having been saved. So this group of people having been saved. And here's the point. When we look at this scripture, we see something. It's not that they saved themselves, but they were saved. They were the recipients of that which brought about their deliverance. Now, here again, this is another time where that word, tzazo, meaning I saved. This is in the past, it would be I having been saved. But here we see something that it is a participle. So it's describing an individual who has been saved or brought through something because there's a preposition attached to that same word that oftentimes means salvation in the spiritual sense, but here it does not. It simply means that they have been delivered. They have been brought through, and there's the preposition that's attached as a prefix to this verb, having been brought through and delivered. So that's where we begin, reminding that God delivered them. And we keep reading, it says, and then they recognize that the island is called Malta. So we can look and you can go into your Bible, and oftentimes there's maps and such, or you can go on the internet and you can see this journey that they went through and ultimately now they're not far from Italy because they're on the island of Malta. God had brought them to this location. Let's press on, look at verse 2. But the, and your Bible, my say, barbarians. Now, the Greek word is indeed a word that relates to a barbarian, but we need to understand it properly. There's, there's two nuances of that word. One is a, a very cruel person in behavior. That is not what this phrase means. No, this same word for a barbarian, if we go back to the original purpose, it simply means one that is foreign or different. And most often it had to do with individuals that were from a different culture than you and also spoke a different language. So because they behave differently and spoke differently, Oftentimes this term barbarian was used, but don't understand it in the way that we think of it today. It's simply a different type of people. So in verse 2, they came to Malta, and the strangers is a way that we could translate it. The strangers, they showed or manifested. They had four, so it's a presentation a, a kindness that was not uh, normal to us. So the context here and what's said is that these individuals, 
They were of a different cultural background. They spoke a different language, but they showed an uncommon, a kindness, a courtesy, a hospitality that was not regular, meaning they went beyond what was normally done by most people. And this is a good thing. They were showing great kindness and extraordinary kindness to, the writer says, us. And what did they do? For they had kindled a file, fire. Literally, it says, for after kindling a fire, they received each of us. Now, that term means, and think about this, there's a group of people, we might think of them as, as uneducated, not speaking a, a noble language and such. That's wrong. These individuals were different, but they were not less than. They were not uh, uncivilized in one sense. But they came and they received, meaning they welcomed. That's the implication. They welcomed each one of these 276 individuals. They greeted them. And not only that, we've already saw they paid them an not regular kindness or hospitality. They built a fire. And why did they do that? Because also being cold. So they recognize the needs of these individuals. They had swam through the, the water in order to make it to shore. We know that it was winter time, and therefore it would have been cold outside. These individuals took notice of their need, and they provided for them. Verse 3, as that was being done, notice what Paul was doing. He didn't sit back and do nothing, it says, but Paul having gathered a multitude of, of sticks. Now, these would be wooden branches from trees and such. So he didn't think he was too good to help. Rather, he went out and he brought some wood for the fire. But pay attention. It says, and placing them upon the fire. So Paul got this wood, this, these branches, and he placed them upon the fire. And then look at the next part of verse 3. We have a word here that relates to a, a snake. Now, it might be a python, a viper, whatever it might be in your Bible, but it's a word for a snake, and it says, out of the heat. So he was putting this in, these wooden branches, into the, the fire, and because of the heat, that serpent did something. It came forth, and it some Bibles will say latched, literally it's a word for attacked. It attacked his arm. So here Paul, having gone through so much adversity, but being brought through this terrible shipwreck, having been at sea for more than two weeks, having very little to eat, having to swim ashore for his life, and now it seems that everything's good. And what happens? Paul, gathering up this wood, put it upon the fire. Out comes this snake because of the heat of the flames and latches himself upon the, the hand of Paul. Notice the response. We find that uh, uh, they, verse 4, and when they saw, who's they? The barbarians. When these strangers, in other words, saw that the beast was, was latched or hanging out from his hand, they spoke to one another and they said something like, there's no doubt or for sure or totally that this man is a murderer. Now, this is what they did and this is very common and so much of, of what we're reading has some serious theological implications. They see that this shipwreck took place, but all 276 passengers were, were saved. And now they come, they're welcomed by then. This fire has been kindled and Paul comes with additional wood to put on. And what happens? 
this snake, this viper, latches onto his arm. And when they saw this, they said, listen, if this man now is going to die, it must be because he's a bad individual. Surely, totally, there's no doubt that this man is a murderer. Having been brought through the sea, him who has been brought through the sea, meaning having been saved through all this stuff that he has encountered. He came out of the sea, but notice what it says. Justice, it says, by justice he was not permitted or allowed to live. Now, that's their thought. And the motivation for it is a wrong theology, which is this. Bad things happen to bad people. Good things happen to good people. So often we think when something happened that's, that's not fortunate, that is, is not good, well, what did I do? What's the cause of it? What is the reason behind it? I mean, if he's suffering, he's must done something that's, that's worthy of that. And this comes from a wrong understanding of the theology of the sovereignty of God that says that everything that happens, God causes. That's not the case. You know what caused it? Time and chance. Now, will God use time and chance? Yes, he will. And let's define what time and chance is. Well, chance. Things happen in this world. Many times I give the example of a tree falling. Now, if a tree is old enough, there's wind, there's some type of weather, and sometimes nothing at all, a tree will fall over. And what happens is this. If by chance and by time you happen to be underneath that tree, it might fall upon you. Does that mean oh, there's some wicked sin that person committed? Not necessarily. Trees fall, things happen. And if you're in the wrong place at the wrong time, things will take place. But here's something. God can take that happening at that time by chance and do what? He can turn it into a message. So quick, these individuals saying, basically, it's justice that this man was not permitted to live. Verse 5. Therefore, he, this is Paul, he shook the beast into the fire. And what happened? And he suffered nothing of harm. So no harmful thing happened to him immediately. But what happens? Well, that, that viper, that snake that bit him, he was poisonous. That's why the people thought for a moment that he was a murderer because of that bite. Now he's going to die. And justice but what happens? They were expecting for him to swell up, and we've seen this. I have an acquaintance, a friend. He was bitten by a snake, a very deadly snake. He was rushed to the hospital, and I saw him three, four months after this incident, and his whole hand was still excessively swollen. So you can explain, or you can understand, What's being said here? For they were watching with expectation that, that certainly, meaning in the coming time, it would swell and he would fall suddenly dead. Now that's their experience. They recognize that type of snake. Someone's bit by, bit by it. They swell up and they fall dead. But, but that didn't happen to Paul. Why? Look at Verse, verse 6, the second half. Upon much time they were expecting. So they thought that he would fall dead and they were expecting this for much time. And they were seeing, however, they perceive that nothing of the sort happened to him. Now, when that took place after a long time he was bit no swelling he never fell down dead there seemed to be miraculously no consequences to that that snake bite what happened look at the end of verse 6 and they changed 
their opinion. That's what that word means, to come to a different perspective. Now, here's something so important. Many times, God allows certain things to happen. He's not the cause of it. Sometimes he is. But in this case, he wasn't the cause of it. It simply happened. It is a normal outcome. There are snakes, oftentimes, by wood. And therefore, whenever, I can remember growing up, we had a, a fireplace, and therefore we would bring wood in from the outside, and we needed to be careful when we took a piece of wood. There might be some, some animal, something there, a spider, whatever, a snake, for example. And so we were told to be cautious doing that. Well, Paul, he took this wood, and there was indeed a snake there. And God didn't cause that snake to be there. He didn't make that snake bite him. It was a natural response from being thrown into the fire. He jumped forth and bit Paul. What happens, though? Nothing. And they, look at the end of verse 6, they changed their opinion and they said, for he is a God. Now, that's quite a change. I mean, in just a, a few, few moments, maybe a few hours or a day, we don't know for, for certain, but they watched him for a significant amount of time, maybe hours, maybe a day or so, and they saw nothing happening. And therefore, instead of saying, no, he must be a murderer, they said, no, he's, he's a God. Only a God could do that. Now, that opened up an opportunity, this bad thing that happened to Paul. God turned it around to good. And that's a great example of the sovereignty of God. God's sovereignty does not demand that everything he does. But the sovereignty of God allows for God to take whatever and turn it into that which is good, that which is according to his will, that which will serve his purposes. And this gave Paul an excellent opportunity to explain about God. Move on to verse 7. Now, in verse 7, we're going to see that perhaps because of that event, Paul's taken to a very important resident of Malta. Look at verse, verse 7. And in those parts, now it's simply in the, but the is plural, and it's referring to the places around that location. And it existed in that region, what existed? A leader. Now, the word simply means the first one. Oftentimes it's translated probably in, in many English Bibles as the chief, but we're talking about the person with the greatest priority the one that's that's at the center the leader the chief resident of the island and he was named and we would say Poplios. now that's how it is in in greek uh, i made it a little bit more anglicized but but we have that name some take that 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 two letters uh and make it a b for Phobias, something along those lines. And we find here that, that this one invited us, meaning Paul and the group that was with him, for three days. And what did he do? He entertained him. He provided hospitality as well in a very friendly way. Now, there's something else that we need to see about this passage. And that is, Paul could have wound up on any location but god brought them to a place where not only the common folks that we talked about earlier that they met but also this prestigious individual he also showed to them great kindness great hospitality and welcomed them there with this hospitality notice what it says at the end of, of verse 7 he did so for three days you think it's just a, a, a um, what's the word, a coincidence that, that three is mentioned here? Three has the purpose for, for revealing something, 
manifesting, declaring something. And all of this is to show that God brought them to a great location. And not only that, but notice what else is going to happen. So they were there being entertained and shown hospitality three days by this important man. And what else do we know? Well, look now to verse 8. And it came about that the father of, of Phobius, he had a fever and dysteria, dysentery perhaps. And he was laid up being oppressed. Now, here's where I see God's sovereignty. That God brought them to an island. They received much kindness from individuals who entertained them, provided they had nothing, and they provided for them. And what happens? They take Paul and perhaps others of them to this leader of the island, and this man's father has a fever. He has dysentery, so his, his stomach is, is not right. And notice something else. He is laid up oppressed, but Paul's there. And what happens? We find in the second half of verse 8. And Paul entered into this one, and he prayed, and he set his hand upon him, his hands upon him, and he healed him. So now God brought them to a location where he met a leader of this island. Now, here again, this is a fulfillment of prophecy. You say, what prophecy? Well, go back to Acts chapter 9. God told Paul, Paul, I need to use you. For what purpose? For being a person that testifies between, before leaders, kings and leaders. And that's what's happening. He's on his way to testify to Caesar. And here in this island, Malta, He's testifying to the leader of this location. And his father is sick with a fever and dysentery. A person can die from that in that day and age. And what did Paul do? He healed him in a moment and notice the outcome. This gave opportunity not just for a few people, but notice verse 9. Therefore, because this was done, also the remaining ones meaning other ones who had these, these sicknesses and diseases in the island. What happened? It says, they came before and also they were healed. So now God brought Paul in order to have a ministry on that island in blessing these people. And because of that, what happens? Well, you can imagine the testimony of Messiah Yeshua and his healing power of not just from diseases and, and other ailments, but also the healing spiritually. The forgiveness of sins could be proclaimed. Now, verse, verse 10. And these, so these individuals bestowed much honor so they honored with much honor the apostle paul it says here us and we we departed now this is that they continued to set sail but notice what happened before that they having placed or set to us the things of our need so these individuals they said, Paul, you're traveling on. You have more of a journey. You've got nothing. They don't have money. They don't have food. They don't have any clothes except what's on their back. They have nothing. And these individuals, they were healed to serve. They were healed to meet the needs of others. And notice how they started practicing toward truth. Now, someone would hear that and say, that's not in the scripture. Sure it is. What is foundational in the Torah? Via hafta l'reacha kamoka. Love your neighbor as yourself. 
If you had need to get to a certain location, but didn't have the resources that you needed because of some shipwreck, because of factors beyond your control, wouldn't you want someone to provide that for you? Certainly. Well, these individuals, that's exactly what they did. They saw the need, they saw what was lacking, and they provided it for Paul. We see the providence of God, the hand of God, in all of these circumstances. Now move to, to verse 11. And after three months, now we're telling us, after three months, they, they sailed in a boat, having wintered in the island. So not just for three days, but that number three appears again. And they were there for three months because, once again, in the Mediterranean, people don't travel by boats in the wintertime to a large degree. Certainly not great distances. It's not safe. You spend the winter in a location. So God brought these individuals to a place where they receive exceedingly good kindness meeting their needs and what did paul do what do you think he was doing healing people both physically and spiritually that there was a testimony and therefore these individuals they wanted to respond to what they had received and they blessed paul and those traveling with him look again at verse verse 11 and after three months we we journeyed on in the boat having wintered in the island and the boat here was a boat of alexandria and we find furthermore that this boat was was marked by and look at it says dioscopus now what's that dioscopus well the first word has to do with two and it speaks about a a false god literally twins some Bibles will have some extra things or names written that don't appear in the Texas Receptus, what I'm using. They will have the names of these, what we would call two deities. And what was the person, purpose of this? Well, as we've just seen, sailing can be a dangerous proposition. So there was the kind of a patron symbol, a patron god of sailors. And when they come, they saw this symbol marked on the boat from Alexandria. Now, this is important. Why? Because Paul, he doesn't fear these things. We receive emails at least one or two each week with a question, a spiritual question. Someone gave me this. I found this in my house. This is in my in-laws and whatnot. I'm afraid to go in. I don't want to be associated with these things. Well, in one sense, that is commendable. We don't want to have pagan things around us. But realize something. They have no power whatsoever. They are nothing more than stone or wood or metal or something along those lines. They have no authority to it. You say, well, demons can attach to that. Well, be very careful. When we, God forbid, when a person worships those, utilize those in some spiritual purpose, that's when demons can, can begin to, to move and act in a person's life. When we give them spiritual authority to do so through false worship. But in and of themselves, they have no power whatsoever. We need not be afraid of them. That time, everyone was almost pagan if they weren't Jewish or not a believer. And therefore, Paul, it mentions that, that this boat had this insignia, this symbol upon it, but Paul got into it anyway, and they traveled. Look now to, to verse 12. And they journeyed on. They set sail to Syracuse. And they remained there for three days. Now, I mean, I hope you're seeing something. The number three is appearing over and over and over in this text. And there's a reason for this. This is revelation. 
God is communicating to us. Just don't read this as kind of a travel log and a few uh, uh, happenings along the way. This is theological writings to teach us biblical truth. How God now is moving them and as he has been moving them exactly where they could find blessing and deliverance and sustenance in order that this journey would end successfully. So once again, verse 12, and sailing on into Syracuse, we remained three days. And from there, we went around and arrived to a place called, called Rigium. Now, this is getting close to their, their destination. And we say, see that after one day, they recognize what's called a notu, which is a, a small southern wind. And this is good for sailing. So they decided to set out at that time. And notice it says that they, we came to a place called Poti Oli. So they're getting closer to their destination. But notice something else. They arrived at this place, look if you would, to verse 14. Having come to this place, it says, where we found brothers. And this means brothers in the Lord. And they invited, we were invited by them to remain, how long? Seven days. Now, some Bibles, they are careless. They'll say seven days, it's a week, we'll just put week. That is incorrect. Seven appears there. Seven days. And seven has to do with purpose. You say, well, seven has to do with holiness. Exactly right. Holiness is found in the purposes of God. Seven does not mean complete or whole. It's not the number of completion. That's not seven, that's ten. Seven has to do with purpose. So they're traveling on, and this is to reveal to us, indeed, the purpose of God is going to be met. Second part of verse 14, and thus into Rome we came. Now, you have to be careful because this does not mean the city of Rome. It means the region of Rome. They have arrived into Italy, in other words, very close to the city of Rome. And once more, this is just another statement that shows God's providence. Think of all the things that happen, but nevertheless, these individuals are going to arrive. Now, you're probably asking, all 276? No. There were many people traveling on that boat. We had soldiers, we had a crew, and we had passengers, but there was also those that were with Paul, other prisoners with those soldiers and the centurion. We don't know necessarily how many, but certainly a small number compared to the 276 that are now this smaller number with Paul who are traveling. They make it into the region of Rome or into Italy. Verse 15. From there, the brethren heard the things concerning us. Now, what Paul did was this. Paul simply testified of what happened in his life and how God never left him, didn't forsake, forsake him, but God was with him, delivering him throughout all of these trials and hardships and difficulties. And once more, don't think because Paul was having obstacles, oh, this is in God's will. We know for certainty this is God's will, that God is the one that said he was going to testify in Rome. Verse 15. From there the brethren heard concerning the things of us. And, and they went out to meet us until a place called Api Forum and three taverns. Now, a tavern, this was a place of refreshment. It was a place to go and get food and sustenance. It's not like a modern-day bar. 
It was a place for provisions. So they came and once more, isn't it interesting? They came in this place called a P. Well, it's like a form, which is a, another word for an keeper. We would say shuk or marketplace. So they came to the place of commerce and they went into this place called three taverns, which was a place of sustenance. But how important again, the number three appears. Whom Paul seen, what did he do? He gave thanks to God and received encouragement. So when Paul saw these individuals coming to him, fellow believers, having this opportunity, being brought to the place where he can have his sustenance from a physical standpoint provided, what did he do? He gave much thanks concerning this situation to God and he was encouraged. Verse 16. Verse 16 is going to be our last verse. But when we came into Rome, now they're in the heart of Rome. The centurion gave the prisoners to the soldiers. This probably means Roman soldiers, not that accompanied them, but rather Roman soldiers that were serving in Rome. What did he do? He delivered the prisoners to those officials in Rome and therefore he had completed his task his assignment the soldiers that served with the centurion they were probably relieved of duty for a moment but what about Paul but and this is an important word it shows a distinction in contrast to being given over to soldiers what did this centurion do well think about it for a moment he had spent considerable time with Paul he had heard Paul's testimony he had seen Paul praying doing miracles that is God's miracles done through him and I believe that Paul made a great impression upon this centurion unto the fact that he treated him differently now he had to go before Caesar that was the rule but notice that he did not deliver Paul to the soldiers to be put in some dungeon. But what did he do? But Paul, he permitted to remain on his own. Now, what that probably meant was that was provided for Paul some type of residence, a place that he could live like an apartment today, not in a prison. And it says, with a soldier guarding him so paul was brought to rome he was was provided for god kept him out of this dungeon which was a very hard situation and paul had been through that already in in israel in jerusalem in caesarea also in israel but now in rome because of what this centurion had seen and because of other believers he was now being provided for in preparing for him to make this testimony before Caesar. Well, we're going to close with that until next week when we pick up this same story once more. But here's the good news. We're going to conclude it and our study of the book of Acts. God is faithful. God is delivering. And God will bring you into his will that you might accomplish everything that he has for you. And that's one of the reasons that we've been saved and we're still in this body is that we might carry out the purposes of God. And if you are hearing the Holy Spirit, if you are submissive to the Holy Spirit, you're going to be passionate, you're going to be committed, and you're going to be moving along, fulfilling the purposes of God for your life and in doing so there is great joy let me remind you of one last thing think about all of these horrible things that happened to paul but god delivered him and paul never not one time do we hear paul doubting not one time do we hear paul complaining no paul understood 
the spiritual reality. And the more that we study this book, and the more that we apply it to our life, the more that we're going to grow in our knowledge of spiritual truth, not just theological truth, but also how God moves in the life of his people. He wants to do significant things. Will you submit to that? Well, with that, I'll close until next week. Shalom from Israel.